Hi, today we're going to talk about Throne of Eldraine. Yeah, that. It came out in October 2019, and it's about to rotate out of standard, and to put it gently, it's been problematic. This is a graph of all the cards that have ever been banned in standard, grouped by set. Once you remove the sets with anti-cards, you're left with two sets at the top, Mirrodin and Throne of Eldraine. Mirrodin kind of cheats because of the six Mirrodin cards that got banned, five of them were part of a cycle that pretty much all functioned identically. They've never had to ban a cycle before or since, so that leaves Throne of Eldraine. Not Urza Saga, not Tempest, Throne of Eldraine. First, let's hit on Kaladesh, because, as is often the case, context is key to figuring out how something completely bonkers could even happen in the first place. Three cards from Kaladesh were banned in standard, along with two cards from the second set in its block, Aether Revolt. As it turns out, a lot of cards got banned while Kaladesh was legal thanks to a combination of a new ban philosophy and the fact that the cards were just really, really good. Usually this many cards don't need to get banned all at once. This represents the longest stretch in the entire history of the game up to that point, where so many cards were banned at once. Something had to be done, and the play design team was born. The play design team was and is responsible for the health of tournament environments, and they address that by playtesting cards and making tweaks before they go to print. In June 2019, founding member Andrew Brown detailed Play Design's fire philosophy that they'd adhered to since Guilds of Ravnica. Among other things, Play Design, and by extension Fire, provided the necessary license to push the power level of cards. It's alright if the cards are really good, because there's a dedicated team of literal and figurative wizards keeping a close eye on things. Fire is a good thing, because without it, you get stuff like this. I refuse to believe that someone playtesting Prophecy in order to get the set ready for a wide release put Ristic Cave onto the battlefield multiple times, determined that they were happy with its impact on gameplay, and shipped it, along with the other 142 toilet cards, to the printer. All else being equal, it's good practice to err towards making cards maybe too good than to make cards that are safe but unexciting. Too good at least sells cards. The sets released in 2019 stress-tested this theory, culminating in Throne of Eldraine. At this point, the best deck in Standard is based around Field of the Dead. It's an incredibly hard deck to interact with because it's more or less deterministic and it's based on lands. The mana's really good, so you get to play with all the best cards for free, and if your opponent somehow cooks up a way to deal with all of those, well, then there's the zombies to contend with, and there are a lot of them. Field of the Dead wasn't supposed to be good post Eldraine. Field of the Dead was legal alongside Morning Tide reprint Scape Shift for a little less than three months. Field of the Dead Scape Shift decks were supposed to have their day, Throne of Eldraine would cause Scape Shift to rotate out, and that would be that. As it turns out, Field of the Dead didn't need Scape Shift. It had Golos, Circuitous Route, Growth Spiral, Hydroid Crisis, a bunch of gates, a bunch of duels. You get the picture. Sam Black over at Star City Games wrote an article about a then-overlooked Throne of Eldraine Planeswalker. It read as hyperbolic at the time. The logic was that Field of the Dead was actually keeping this weirdo of a Planeswalker in check. Then, on October 21st, it was announced that Field of the Dead would be banned in Standard, along with... Arkham's Astrolabe and Pauper. Sure. And just like that, the Winter of Oko was underway. Without Field of the Dead to go over the top and effectively keep Oko in check, the exact event Sam Black predicted came true. And these results confirm it. In terms of total wins, none of the other archetypes at Mythic Championship 6 even came close to the food deck's output. The deck's core is pretty simple, and largely reads like a Throne of Eldraine block constructed deck. The deck was so prominent and obvious that some folks splashed Black for main deck Noxious Grasp. Noxious Grasp and Aether Gust saw main deck play at Mythic Championship 6, just to give you an idea of how warped Standard had gotten. Two weeks later, Oko, along with Once Upon a Time and Veil of Summer, got hit with a Standard ban. Things were pretty rough over in Modern 2. Play Design's Fire Philosophy had a death grip on the format, exemplified by the top eight decks at Grand Prix Columbus. Analysis like this skews towards older sets, because for this, we took the first modern legal printing of each card. It also skews heavily towards years when fetch lands were printed. And yet, 2019 crushes in a runaway. Granted, a lot of this was because of Modern Horizons, but I'm giving that set a pass. 
Modern Horizons marked the first time ever a set like that went to print. The entire point of the set was to impact Modern, and it did. That's okay. What's less okay is the outsized role Throne of Eldraine played in the proceedings. This is the deck that won the Grand Prix. It revolves around Urza, and Gilded Goose and Emery play particularly well with it. Predictably though, Oko stole the show, providing enough defense for the deck to cast Karn and fetch Mycosynth Lattice with it. Mycosynth Lattice turns all the opponent's permanents to artifacts, which Karn conveniently shuts off. And that's game. Two months later, Oko was banned in Modern along with Mycosynth Lattice and Mox Opal. That left enough room for another Throne of Eldraine card to dominate. Amulet Titan existed way before Throne of Eldraine. Wanna see a turn to win? Sweet, so do I. But the set gave the deck two new four ofs, Castle Garenbrig and Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time is a cool enough idea. You get to cast it for free, it smooths out your draws, but in reality it acts as a loading screen for both players, like Sensei's Divining Top before it. These cards are where the Venn diagram of convenience and obligation overlap. Predictably, Once Upon a Time was banned two months later. The very next day, the World Health Organization confirmed that COVID-19 was a pandemic. With play relegated to online only, Throne of Eldraine continued to lay waste to standard. A contender for best deck surface centering around newcomer Luca. The plan was simple. Play Luca, offer up a token to its minus two ability, hit Agent of Treachery, steal their best thing, game over. But the card that tied the room together, the card that really made the deck hum, was Fires of Invention. A turn four Fires of Invention meant that on turn five, you could cast Luca, feed a token to it, go get Agent of Treachery, steal an opponent's thing, then cast your Yorian Companion, blink your Agent of Treachery, and steal another thing. Soon enough, Fires of Invention and Agent of Treachery were banned, along with some very awkward companion errata. After the Wonders of Masks block, Ristic Cave! Wizards of the Coast hired former pro Randy Bueller, the first of many pros they'd hire to help make sure magic cards weren't broken in half. Between then and Kaladesh, there were three standard bannings. Skull Clamp, the rest of the Affinity deck, and the key elements of Cawblade. 17 years, three bans. Fires of Invention and Agent of Treachery marked the seventh standard ban announcement in less than four years. And you could make the argument that you know, maybe a couple more cards could have and should have been banned in standard in those 17 years, but they weren't. The idea here is that bans have a compounding effect. They erode consumer confidence. Or do they? This is TCG player sales data for Oko Thief of Crowns. The line is average price sold. The bottom bars are quantity sold. This tall bar here? Well, that's the day Oko was banned in standard. Demand skyrocketed. Folks figured they could get in cheap, and as a result, the price actually went up. As players, we want bans to be untenable. We want them to have some sort of cost, some sort of sacrifice of equity attached. Right now, we just don't have any evidence that that's the case. Here's the sales chart for Fires of Invention. That spike there, the Dayoko got banned. Not convinced yet? Great, here's some more stuff. Here's the Scarab God, and that spike is when those four cards got banned. Here's Etherworks Marvel. That's when Felidar Guardian got banned. Philidar Guardian is a funny story, by the way. You see, they said they weren't gonna ban it, and then they said, whoa, 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 now that we have two more days of data, turns out that's enough to ban it. Cool, cool. The TLDR here is exactly what everyone's hoping to hear, and that is that bans don't matter, and that actually, marketing works. So yeah. Oh yeah, somewhere in all of this, they had to ban Mystic Sanctuary in Pauper of all things because the 12 people who played that format were bummed out or whatever, but while we're here, can we talk about how ludicrous this card is? Okay, first of all, it's an island, so you can fetch it, which, whatever, cool, I guess, sure. As it turns out, every format with fetch lands also has a bunch of dual lands that count as islands and something else, and bonkers instants and sorceries to get back with it. So the opportunity cost to play Mystic Sanctuary in your deck is effectively zero, since it's a land. And the upside is that it puts Cryptic Command back on top of your deck, which lets you bounce the Mystic Sanctuary when you counter a spell so you can get the Cryptic Command back. And yeah, it's really great. So that's July. God, there's still so much, so much happened. The set is crazy. And I know that the Mountain Goats guy likes it, but A, who cares, and B, 
what about the set is novel? The setting is this. Adventures are this, a card stapled onto another card that you have to play in a certain order. Adamant is this. So now things like Dual Lands, which are already good, are what, even better now? Why? What? Who is this for? Who asked for this? To John's point, which is a fair one, I like to think that I like new sets just fine, even when the flavor doesn't hit my specific taste. But in the interest of being totally transparent about my position, I am a human being in the world who would like to have faith that Wizards of the Coast, a subsidiary of Hasbro, is not simply attempting to extract the maximum amount of money from me by creating a continuous domino effect of broken formats and bans. That is my position. So let's go to August and oh look, more bans. Cauldron Familiar. It's a combo with Witch's Oven. Sacrifice the cat to the oven, get a food, sack the food, cat comes back, drain for one, rinse, repeat. The cat is now an infinite blocker. As long as the opposing thing doesn't have trample or flying, this one one is just gonna block it all day. Before damage gets assigned, you put it in the oven, you sack the food, get the cat back, easy peasy. And if you have a trail of crumbs, <laughs> well then, hoo wee, you got a stew going. All these cards are in the same set and they were pushed. So pushed that they got banned alongside three other busted cards that probably should have never seen the light of day. And are you sensing how tiresome this all is? Keep in mind, there was a pandemic going on during all this. So, hey, that vaccine that's gonna allow you to see your loved ones, yeah, isn't gonna be ready till next spring. And by the way, standard sucks. Again, sorry about that. In his State of Design 2020 column, Mark Rosewater acknowledged high-level balance issues, mentioning that while it was important for design to keep swinging, they needed to recognize that taking all those swings has a very real cost. Totally fair. Once design stops swinging for the fences, we get more of this. For the low, low cost of four mana, you too can deploy a hill giant that will just give your opponent as many spells as their heart desires. Maybe you would like to give your opponent a bunch of free jumps. Maybe you would like to give them some free tremors. How about free mind peels or maybe stave offs? Now you can give any of these mediocre spells to your opponent absolutely free of charge. Wow, what a bargain. Moving right along. September's here, and you know what that means? More bans. This time it's Uro, which, good lord, are you starting to sense a pattern here? I think we finally found an identity for Simic. Nope, it's not Graft, it's not Evolve either, and it's definitely not whatever was in Ravnica Allegiance. You wanna know what the real Simic identity was all along? It's whatever the hell you want. Wanna draw some cards, gain some life? Let's do it. You wanna kill creatures? We do that too now. You want a ramp? Got you covered. Need an absurdly big creature? Let's go. You need a clone? We do clones now. Like what? Like what is this? Welcome to October. Time to ban more cards. This time the third best Throne of Eldraine block constructed deck, Adventures, had to go. And Escape to the Wilds went with it for good measure. The old Adventures deck with a Lucky Clover and Omnath is actually worth breaking down because it was totally obnoxious. So here we go. All right, so you've got six adventure creatures, which, like I said before, are already two for ones in and of themselves. So let's add Lucky Clover and Edgewall Innkeeper to the mix just to make them obnoxiously good. Note that so far, this is 100% Throne of Eldraine cards and that two of the three cards that got banned, all from this deck, mind you, are from Throne of Eldraine. Great. Moving right along to the deck. You draw a bunch of cards so your man is perfect, all your stuff is a two for one, and then if the outcome of the game is ever in doubt, you refill your hand with Escape from the Wilds, yet another Throne of Eldraine card, and that's that. Good stuff. Since then, standard's been relatively quiet, and I think you can chalk that up to what else but Throne of Eldraine. Even without Lucky Clover, the adventure decks headlined by Bonecrusher Giant and Lovestruck Beast outpace anything else the format's capable of by a lot. In his AMA blog, Mark Rosewater was asked an innocuous enough question. I see a lot of people dumping on magic, but I like magic. Am I crazy? And Mark replied, no, you're not crazy. Magic just had its best year ever. Okay then. Being the curious fellow I am, I reached out to Mark and asked him how they measure the best year ever. Graciously, he replied, sales. 
Saying sales, especially in 2020, is dubious for lots of reasons. Magic released a pretty standard amount of things in 2020, but layer secret layers on top and you've got a recipe to sell a lot of things. Another layer here is that there's a global pandemic going on, which means people can't go to their brick and mortar LGS to sell their cards. So an LGS now only has one place to go if they want to keep their magic supply. Wizards of the Coast. So yeah, of course WotC was going to have a record-breaking year while folks couldn't get in their stores. They were the store's only supply of cards. Moreover, measuring success in sales or profit margin without acknowledging global or even user sentiment is like saying McDonald's is responsible for the best hamburgers on earth. Shout out to Jeff Cunningham, the best magic writer of all time, who made that observation two years earlier. It is disheartening to see someone of Mark's stature and intelligence cite quarantine and not all of this as the reason people are dissatisfied with magic. By essentially dismissing the validity of the criticism, he implicitly gives Wizards of the Coast license to ignore user sentiment and keep doing whatever they feel like doing. On the other hand, this is all from a competitive player's standpoint, which is an audience segment WotC is visibly divesting from. In May, WotC announced that they'd be sunsetting the Rivals and MPL program. In a follow-up tweet, the official Magic account explicitly stated that organized play post Rivals MPL will not be set up to facilitate competitive Magic as a career. People had lots to say about this, but it's important to explore the possibility that none of it matters. Throne of Eldraine hit shelves in fall 2019, and 2020 was Magic's best year ever. Bans had no impact on sales. Maybe Mark Rosewater was right. People complained, but did their relationship with Magic ultimately change? Based on the available data, I'd say no. Will it change? <laughs> I think I'm a little too biased to answer that question. I make videos about Magic as an intellectual sport, so yeah, I'm pretty invested in competitive Magic. Commander is obviously great for the game, but if Magic's gonna keep pushing all these card variants onto players, I think those collectibles need more than Commander underpinning them. But there are some data points to suggest that WotC does care about sentiment around competitive play and is trying to right the ship. Kaldheim, Strixhaven, and AFR are sets that are very clearly powered down. I think they're definite steps in the right direction, compelling without being totally broken. There's some definite complexity creep going on, but on balance, I think it's good. Standard rotation will be good. Sets like these are a good thing, and moreover, the fact that these are happening at all suggests that, for whatever reason, WotC is not too keen to have another Throne of Eldraine. At least not in standard. That's all I got on this, but while we were not doing these videos, I designed a blog for TCG Player, and now I manage the editors who run it, so I don't really have a ton of spare time for these anymore. We actually made this video that you just watched for a work hackathon in which I kind of hacked away at the rules that implied that this sort of thing wouldn't be allowed, but it's here. And if you want to keep watching this stuff, and God knows I want to keep making them because I need the attention, you should do four things. I know that's a lot, but just stay with me. First, the algorithm gaming stuff. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment, preferably about how this video changed your life for the better. And then, every time you buy a Magic card on TCG Player, use the link in the description because A, it's the cheapest place to buy Magic cards, you were gonna buy them here anyway, and B, we'll get credit for the sale, which means that enough of you do this, my boss is gonna be like, holy shit, people like this stuff this much? We need to make you a full-time video guy. I don't really know what they're called or what I'm even doing, but whatever. You know what you have to do now, so thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. All right, Mystic Sanctuary got banned in Modern in February. Bye for real this time. Bye. Goodbye.